So a lot of the research I've been discussing today is part of my forthcoming book, Deported to Death, which should be out with the University of California Press in the summer of 2019. Um, this book really explores the dangers that people face upon removal to Mexico, as well as the various ways in which drug-fueled violence has changed the migration experience. And one of the reasons that I wrote this book is particularly to, to give people an important roadmap towards the asylum claims that many people are eligible for but are not making, right? We typically don't consider Mexicans as being eligible for asylum because of extremely high uh, denial rates. However, a lot of the conditions that people face because of the ways that they're removed often show just how dangerous the situation is, just how likely they are to experience issues such as torture or kidnapping and even to be murdered. And so I think that this book really should serve for, for a wide audience of people as a kind of a roadmap to making some of these important arguments about why it's dangerous to remove people from the United States in mass. I'm trying to find out more about the consequences of our immigration and border enforcement policies. Um, I think through research and through interviews with people post-deportation, we can get a better idea about how they live through these practices. It's one thing to see you know, a policy and a practice written down in a government report, but it's another to actually go through it. And so one of my you know, deep questions is, how do people experience immigration enforcement? And then what are the consequences of that upon removal to Mexico, especially when we're dealing with such kind of unprecedented levels of conflict along the U.S.-Mexico border on the Mexican side? The main group of people that I focus on in my research are deportees, right? Um, we tend to think of deportation as a simple process, right? Sending someone back to their homes. But in reality, it's not, right? Um, you know, almost everyone is deported directly to the U.S.-Mexico border. Very few deportees are actually from the border. And so it would be kind of akin to sending someone from New York back to uh, Seattle, Washington, right? There's not really any location, any sort of connection there. And so I've been working with deportees now for about 15 years to try and understand how they live the border, how they navigate these areas that are extremely violent, extremely dangerous, but also what their next steps might be. Are they going to return to some place in Mexico where they might not have any contacts anymore? Or are they going to try and cross back again into the United States despite the prohibitions on crossing the border? We had a, a, a major statistical survey project where we surveyed people in five different locations uh, in Mexico. So in Tijuana, in Mexicali, Baja California, Nogales, Sonora, Ciudad Juarez, Chihuahua, Nuevo Laredo, Tamaulipas, and Mexico City when people are deported by airplane. Um, these surveys were 250 questions a piece, uh, lasted about an hour. Um, you had to have crossed the border without papers, been apprehended, and been returned to Mexico within the last 30 days. Um, and, you know, this project was uh, designed to really understand what that experience is like. We typically have worked both at the Port of entry, so right where people are dropped off on the bus, they walk back across the border, and we've worked right there with um, Mexican government officials, but also in migrant shelters, right? So shelters provide an important uh, safety mechanism for, for migrants, right? You know, even though migration is extremely low, we're still talking about hundreds of thousands of people removed to the, Mexico, the, the Mexican side of the border every year. Without the shelters, they would be on the streets. And so we've partnered with a lot of these shelters to work with people, as well as institutions in Mexico, such as the Colegio de la Frontera Norte, the COLEF, and Universidad Autónoma de Ciudad Juárez to help us in our, in our research efforts. We started to see a strange phenomenon along the border. Namely, there were many more people being repatriated to northeastern Mexico than were being apprehended there. And this is in the same time when we started to see migrant massacres in the region, right? There was a famous massacre of 72 migrants in San Fernando, Tamaulipas. And the following year, almost 200 bodies were found in mass graves in those same areas. And yet we were seeing this extreme increase in the number of people that didn't have to be removed to that area. And we did some more research and we found that really what was happening is that through this, uh, collaboration between police and immigration authorities in the United States, 
we were seeing that those people were being removed specifically to this region. So a large concentration of people who were apprehended by police while living and working in the United States and then were moved to these areas. And especially these were people that often had criminal records, um, sometimes very minor, such as driving without a license, sometimes more severe. And yet, these are the people that had the most connections to the United States and winding up in the most dangerous part of the border. It's hard to know exactly why that was happening, but it certainly created the conditions to make the situation much worse on the ground for people, namely an increase in kidnapping, extortion, um, and also forced recruitment into drug cartels as you have thousands of people that are essentially homeless, might not know anyone in Mexico, and are extremely vulnerable because of lack of work, lack of money, lack of options. The idea of the migrant is something to hate, something to fear. It's an easy scapegoat because the migrant isn't from here. They're not even going to stay here, right? It's transitory. It's in, someone in motion. And I think this has created the conditions at which we can see extreme levels of abuse and violence committed towards migrants. And so one of my colleagues, Oscar Mizael Hernandez, has written an op-ed about when do we start talking about migrant aside, migrantesidio, this idea that these are a group of people that can easily be killed, be tortured, be extorted, and no one will miss them because they're in transit, right? Often they lose contact with relatives for weeks and months, and it makes it very hard to figure out what happened to them. And they're also, especially at the border, a long way from home and a long way from their destinations, this kind of limbo area. Um, and, and this is something important for us to think about in terms of the conflict in Mexico, for instance, right? With over 200,000 people dead and 40,000 people missing and disappeared. How many of those people are missing or are killed because of their movement through these areas, right? There's kind of a, a bad habit of assuming that this conflict is comprised entirely of people that were fighting over control of drug trafficking and not looking at a lot of the collateral damage for people that are, that are passing through these areas. Um, when we look at the bigger picture, is we have to ask what is it that we're really trying to accomplish with border security? And I think um, what we've seen in terms of what the Border Patrol and what the United States has largely done is the mass interdiction of immigrants. Right? There is very little differentiation in between a person who has any sort of dangerous criminal past and someone who is simply coming to work or be with their family. Right? And so without any sort of real meaningful immigration reform that allows people a legal path to migrate, there will never be a way to seal off the border. One of the issues that we talk about a lot is deterrence. Right? A lot of United States border, border enforcement policy is about deterring people from crossing the border. And I want to challenge that on, on two, two grounds. One, in our research, we found that overwhelmingly, people that think of the United States as their home, people who've put down roots here and have kind of placed the United States in that special, special category that we consider home to be, are going to cross again, right? Despite escalating prison sentences, despite dangerous and difficult crossing conditions, despite uh, having to pay thousands of dollars to smugglers or organized crime to cross the border, they intend to go back, right? There's that pull of home, of family, of children here in the United States, means that our efforts to secure the border are actually gonna be targeting these people, the people that are most connected and most tied to the United States. And on a second ground, when we think about deterrence, at what point are you allowed to punish someone for the possibility of a future crime, right? Often what's happened with our policies for deterrence is they've put people in danger, taking greater risks to cross the border. Um, and we've seen the amount of people that die crossing the border explode. Um, and so I think sometimes we fall into the trap of arguing whether or not deterrence functions, does it work as a policy? And we should be asking whether or not this is the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And I think in many ways, trying to deter people by putting them in danger is the wrong thing to do. My name is Jeremy Slack. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at El Paso in the sociology and anthropology department. I've been a border researcher for the last 16 years. Um, my main focus has been on the ways in which Conflict, violence, and drug trafficking has impacted migration along the U.S.-Mexico border.